Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Cindy Oliver and she's a dog. Quite a few people have drawn my attention to some videos from Dr. John Campbell about some supposed revelations about the Pfizer vaccine in a TGA document from Australia. However, as we will uncover in this video, the document doesn't actually reveal anything new about the Pfizer vaccine. But Campbell's coverage of it does reveal a few things about him. And when I say videos, he has made at least four videos about the document. So he is milking it for as many views as he can get. And he's even done some interviews where he has got some non-experts on to discuss it, like a politician from Australia with a background in finance and a retired immunology professor who touts ivermectin as a wonder cure. Now, I won't be covering everything John and his guests said that was wrong. Otherwise, this video would go for hours and it's going to be pretty long anyway, so I apologise in advance. But I will be covering some of the things that he's got wrong. So buckle up and let's get started. The first thing I want to look at is, is the distribution of the, uh, the lipid nanoparticles. We were told it stayed in the injection site. I can now tell you on YouTube, because this is an official government document, I'm now free to discuss this. As far as what's in that document, I can, I can discuss. Because we can discuss official, official government documents. Uh, that uh, the lipid nanoparticles are widely distributed, very widely distributed. Let's fix your ears. Let's fix your ears. So John claims we were told the vaccine stays in the arm. As you can probably tell from his accent, John is from the UK. Here's an excerpt from the public assessment report for the Pfizer vaccine, which has been available since December 2020 in the UK. I'll just read a little bit of it out for you. Expression in the liver was also present at six hours after injection and was not detected by 48 hours after injection. Information regarding the potential distribution of the test articles to sites other than the injection site following IM administration has been provided and is under review as part of the ongoing rolling assessment. Does that sound like they were saying it all stays in the arm? But to be fair to John, there were some people falsely claiming that vaccines weren't meant to leave the arm. Here's an example. The jab is delivered into the muscle of the arm, but can sometimes enter the bloodstream. Well, yes, it can, but, but it's really quite simple that, that it, uh, it, it shouldn't enter the bloodstream. It, if, if, if you draw back, then you know it's not going to enter the bloodstream. So with good technique, and as I say, I, I could train people up to do this properly in about an hour, as long as they've got, got a modicum of common sense. This, this is really quite simple, and I've been training student nurses to do this for ages. So on being provided with information that some vaccine can enter the blood, John tells his viewers that the information is wrong and it shouldn't enter the blood. He then gets on his hobby horse about aspiration preventing vaccine entering the blood. This is, of course, completely wrong. Aspiration does not stop vaccine or anything else given intramuscularly from entering the bloodstream. Generally, substances are given intramuscularly with the intention of them entering the blood. Here's an old video from a former nurse educator explaining it. Let's think now about intramuscular injections. Now, skeletal muscles are relatively well perfused with blood, so the absorption is fairly rapid, and the drug will start working normally about five or ten minutes after the preparation has been given. So well perfused muscles means that the drug gets from the muscle into the bloodstream, into the systemic circulation fairly quickly. Because when you're giving a drug systemically, the aim is to get it into the plasma. And that happens because the muscle's fairly well perfused. So there you have it. That's why some vaccine is expected to enter the blood. Basic physiology. And remember, of course, this was submitted by the uh, TGA in Australia based on Pfizer's information about the vaccines in January 2021. 
So when they were rolling out the very early stages of the vaccine programme in the UK, all this information, we have to assume, was known by the UK authorities. And yet they still carried on with the vaccination programme. Uh, we assume it was known by uh, all of the US authorities as well, because it's, 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 it's basically information that's related to the vaccine. If the TGA has it, then I think we can assume that all the civilised countries in the world had it, New Zealand, Canada, all of Europe. Now, John is right. All the scientists and clinicians employed by regulatory agencies around the world would have received this information. And the vaccine is approved in 181 different countries. And a lot of the information available in the document is also publicly available from various sources. In fact, the document that John is basing his videos on was released to the public in July 2021, with the exception of a few redactions which were commercial in confidence. For example, information on the exact formulations and how the product is manufactured and information on a different product which isn't in the vaccine. So is John really suggesting that he has picked up something that all the experts around the world have missed? Rats give an intramuscular injection. Now, bear in mind, this is intramuscular injection, not intravenous injection, intramuscular injection. The concentration of lipid, uh, of radioactive lipid nanoparticles reached peak level in the plasma, that's in the blood, of course, at 8.9 micrograms lipid equivalent per mil. That sounds high to me now. Well, it does sound high if you ignore a few critical facts. The dose given in this study was 50 micrograms of mRNA, which is encapsulated in about 1.2 milligrams of lipids, and a milligram is 1,000 times a microgram. Now, the reason the amount of lipids is important is because the blood concentration figure that John has just quoted was for the lipids and not for the mRNA. Now, the dose given to humans is 30 micrograms of mRNA or 0.77 milligrams of lipids, which is 60% of the dose given to the rats. Seems fairly comparable, except, of course, it's not. The typical volume of blood in a Worcester hand rat is about 25 millilitres, whereas the typical volume of blood in a human is about five litres. And what this means is that rats received 333 times the human dose based on blood volume. Uh, and distributed mainly into the liver. So the liver was high concentrations, relatively high concentrations, adrenal gland, spleen and ovaries. Over 48 hours. Now, of course, the ovaries store and uh, mature the ovum so um i'm not going to pretend i'm not a little concerned about this i am more than a little concerned actually um and we can now say this from government data um quite what this means of course we don't yet fully understand let's hope we don't ever fully understand because uh, let's hope it goes away but uh, i suspect it might not now, when John says we don't fully understand, what he means is that he doesn't fully understand. The scientists who evaluated the data from the 181 countries who approve the product do understand. Here's a summary of what they do understand from the European Medicines Agency. And this information has been publicly available since the Pfizer vaccine was approved in Europe. Over 48 hours, distribution was mainly observed to liver, adrenal glands, spleen and ovaries, with maximum concentrations observed at 8 to 48 hours post-dose. Total recovery, percent of injected dose of radio-labelled LMP plus modified RNA outside the injection site was greatest in the liver, up to 21.5%, and was much less in spleen, less than or equal to 1.1%. Adrenal glands, less than or equal to 0.1%, and ovaries, less than or equal to 0.1%. The mean concentrations and tissue distribution pattern were broadly similar between the sexes, 
No evidence of vaccine-related macroscopic or microscopic findings were found in the ovaries in the repeat dose toxicity studies. Study 38166 and study 20GR142. And no effects on fertility were identified in the DART study. So when lipid nanoparticles are injected at an extremely high dose, the amount of radioactive lipid that was found in the ovaries was less than or equal to 0.1% of the injected dose. And this may or not have been intact lipid nanoparticles. Further studies which involved giving three megadoses over 17 days followed by a week recovery, um, by week I mean week time, not week as in not strong, um, showed no effect on the ovaries and this was confirmed by reproductive and developmental studies. And of course it has now also been confirmed in studies in people. So let's just give one example here, the liver. Um, there's the data there. So at 25 minutes, it was 0.74. Now, this the units here are micrograms of lipid equivalent per gram, or in the case of the blood, presumably per mil. So uh, way higher than I would have anticipated. 25 minutes, it was 0.74. One hour, 4.6. Two hours, it's still going up. Four hours, it's still going up. Eight hours, it's still going up. Uh, 24 hours, it looks like it's gone down a bit, 19.24, but at 48 hours, still 24.29. So it looks like it's kind of stabilised there in the 8 to 24 hour period. Um, so the obvious question is, why did they only go up to 48 hours? Why didn't they keep testing until the concentrations went down? So what we can say is the substantial numbers of lipid nanoparticles with the messenger RNA coding for the spike protein in the liver at 48 hours. What, what about three days? What about four days? Didn't seem to be done. Well, the reason that they didn't test beyond 48 hours is because it's actually unethical to do unnecessary animal testing. And every new time point requires an additional six animals to be killed. So that's only going to be done if it provides needed information. But why am I saying that the information isn't needed? Basically, we know from another study included in the document that by 48 hours, there is no translation of mRNA from the, lip from the lipid nanoparticles to protein in the liver. So what this means is that although they are detecting radiation in the liver at 48 hours, it is not from functional nanoparticles. It is either from the lipid with the radioactive marker or a breakdown product of that lipid. So in the study that I am talking about, they encapsulated mRNA designed to express luciferase into lipid nanoparticles and injected them into mice. Luciferase is bioluminescent, so by doing this, they are able to use imaging equipment to see where in the body mRNA is expressing luciferase. And unlike the radiation experiment, these readings can be done while the animal is still alive, although the animals were still sacrificed at the end of the experiment after all the readings had been done for further testing of the spleen. So let's look first at the results for the injection site. The line we are particularly interested in is the light blue one, as this is the LNP with the same formulation as is used in the Pfizer vaccine. So initially, there is a strong sig signal at the injection site, which is what we want. And it reduces to background levels by nine days. So what this means is all the mRNA has been degraded by nine days. So let's look at the liver. Firstly, an important thing to note with this graph is that the y-axis is a different scale than the previous graph. So whereas at the injection site, the average flux at six hours was approximately one times 10 to the nine photons per second, in the liver, it was only approximately 4.94 times 10 to the 7 photons per second, so more than an order of magnitude smaller. And as you can see, by 48 hours, no signal was detected. 
And that's not particularly surprising given one of the functions of the liver is to break stuff down, so to speak. And if you're wondering about levels in the rest of the body, there was none detected. Almost similar microscopic lung inflammation was observed in both challenge control and immunised animals, McKeat monkeys, poor things, uh, after peak infection, after the peak of infection, days seven to eight. So the, these, these animals were deliberately infected. Now, what this is actually saying is that if animals were vaccinated or not, they still had minimal lung inflammation. And I think we can assume that they were inoculated with the Wuhan variety of the original variant of the uh, virus. So in other words, what this is saying is somewhat obscure uh, language. Uh, this is challenged with uh, infection. So they were, the virus was given to these mon poor monkeys and they were unvaccinated. And th they had almost similar microscopic lung uh, inflammation as opposed to those challenged with the uh, virus that had been vaccinated. So we see that the lung inflammation in the vaccinated and unvaccinated was the same. Based on this, they decided that the vaccine was e sufficiently efficacious uh, to, to carry on with the vaccination programme. Now, before I get on to why this clip is just more idiotic nonsense from John, it's worth mentioning that this information has been publicly available since September. 2020, when it was published as a preprint. And it was subsequently published as a peer reviewed article in February 2021 in Nature, which is one of the highest impact journals around. You would have thought if John genuinely found this information so concerning, he would have made a video about it at the time. Now, what the paper and the TGA documents state is that rhesus mark monkeys are known not to show clinical signs of COVID and generally develop only mild lung pathology from SARS-CoV-2 infection. So they can't be used to test their efficacy against severe disease because it doesn't occur in them. What they can be used for, however, is to test if the vaccine reduces viral replication. And the study shows that it did. Importantly, it also showed that there was no antibody-dependent enhancement. Antibodies and T-cells in monkeys declined quickly over five weeks. So the antibodies and these protective T-cells, remember these T-lymphocytes, these small lymphocytes, um, how long did this uh, last for? Well, they declined quickly over five weeks. Five weeks, what, seven fives, 35 days, it? yeah. Uh, raising concerns over long-term immunity. So the report specifically says this raises concerns over long-term immunity. Having raised concerns over long-term immunity, the vaccines were authorised by the TGA and, as we say, presumably all the other agencies. So, yes, antibody levels did decline after five weeks in the monkeys, but they were still higher than the level in human convalescent serum when the last measurement was taken at eight weeks. The human convalescent serum is the grey bar on the right. And, of course, reduction in antibodies over time after either infection or vaccination is expected to happen with any disease. And the fact that they didn't know how long the protection from the vaccine would last was made very clear when the vaccine was approved. This statement was included in the approved product information. The duration of protection afforded by Comanati is unknown as it is still being determined by ongoing clinical trials. Lack of studies investigating potential for autoimmune disease were noted. So the potential for autoimmune disease was noted, but not, not studied. So the thing is here, if you have a cell that's expressing foreign protein, <clears throat> foreign protein, wherever that cell is, um, if a cell is expressing foreign protein, what can happen is the T cell 
for example, a T cytotoxic cell can come along and kill the whole cell. That would be autoimmunity. Uh, no. What John just described as autoimmunity is not autoimmunity. Destroying cells that are expressing foreign proteins is exactly what the immune system is supposed to do. Autoimmunity is when the immune system destroys cells that aren't expressing foreign proteins. Now, the lack of studies investigating the potential for autoimmune diseases is one of the many things that John brings up that wasn't done. What he neglects to include, though, is that the document specifically states the following. However, these deficiencies are either adequately justified by the sponsor or addressable by clinical trials. And in the case of autoimmunity, it has been addressed by clinical data. This study, which was published in Nature Communications, shows that the COVID mRNA vaccines are not associated with autoimmunity, but SARS-CoV-2 infection is. And if you'd like more details about the study, the TWIF team covered it in a recent episode, and I'll provide a link to it in this video's description. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, John also spoke to some other people about the study, including Senator Rennick from Australia. Let's have a look at a bit of that. Another point raised in the document was that the, the, uh, the vaccine, the mRNA codon, has been optimised to improve uh, antigen expression to make more spike protein. And the lipid nanoparticles will actually go into numerous body cells that the virus itself can't gain access into. So, so in a sense that the virus has got much, uh, a much smaller distribution in terms of the tissues it can infect than the, than, than the vaccine itself has. So I hadn't thought of that before. It, it means they could be getting spike protein in, in any cell in the body potentially, whereas the virus would only affect fairly specific cells with the, the ACE receptor. That, that's exactly right, John. And, and that, that particular information was on page 18 and page 19 of the document. Yeah. That information was originally redacted. And so we've only became right. aware of that last December. Now, that's incredibly mm -hmm. important for a number of reasons. If the vaccine produces more spike protein than what the, the virus would, that, that goes against everything a vaccine normally did. A vaccine's normally attenuated. It's meant to be weaker. And you get a smaller dose, not a stronger dose. And the, you know, Because if you're getting a stronger dose, that's kind of counterproductive to the whole purpose of the vaccine. You're not getting greater protection you're getting greater risk um yeah. and yet again you have to ask yourself well is this does this qualify as going to function research when you're in injecting a vaccine that produces more of the antigen not less <laughs> there's so much wrong here that i don't quite know where to start anyway no, it's not gain-of-function research. Gain-of-function research means adding a new function to a pathogen. The mRNA vaccines do not use pathogens. The information that Rennick claims they fought hard to get unredacted has actually been available in numerous scientific papers for ages. Here's an example from a paper published in April 2021. The thing is, though, Rennick is totally misunderstanding why the codon is being optimised to increase protein translation. It isn't so that the vaccine will make more spike protein than the virus. It is so that a lower dose of vaccine can be used. And we know for a fact that the vaccine doesn't produce more spike protein than the virus. And I will provide a link to a previous video, in fact, two previous videos, where I have covered this. And then there is John's statement that COVID only infects cells with ACE2 receptors. Well, here's a list of tissues that contain ACE2 receptors. There's 31 of them, so I won't read them all out, but here's a few. The brain, the prostate, the liver, the ovaries, the pancreas, the heart, the kidneys, and the testes. 
That's that's right. So there's there's four lipids involved in creating the lipid nanoparticle. Two of those lipids had never been used before. And it's interesting, I asked the head of the TGA and estimates about these lipids and he described these lipids as the same as the lipids you'll eat in a stock steak or sausage uh, at breakfast. Well, that's not, not true at all. Uh, one of the lipids is actually ionised, which creates its own, by definition, that's not really a lipid. Um, sure, phospholipids are ionised, but a lipid, you know, in its pure sense of the word, isn't ionised at all. Um, it's hydrophobic. So Senator Rennick says that lipids aren't charged, but then admits that phospholipids, which are lipids, are charged, but then repeats that lipids aren't charged. Hmm. In fact, in addition to phospholipids, fatty acids are also charged. So there's a bucket load of lipids that are charged. So this is the scary charged lipid that is included in the lipid nanoparticles. It is known as DSPC for short. And if you look to the right of the structure, you can see the terrifying negative charge on the oxygen atom and then the horrendous positive charge on the nitrogen atom. Just keep your eyes closed, Cindy. Don't look, don't look. I hope this video doesn't get an R rating after showing this. The lipid is, in fact, a naturally occurring lipid that is found in cell membranes. So it is in breakfast sausages. Now, I expect Senator Rennick got a bit confused and he wasn't talking about the naturally occurring charged lipid included in the lipid nanoparticles. He was most likely talking about this lipid here. ALC0315. This lipid is neutral when it's in the blood, but when it enters the more acidic endosome of the cell, it gains a proton or hydrogen ion and becomes positively charged. As a result, the nanoparticle releases its payload of mRNA, which is pretty cool, unless you are a scaremongering, scientifically illiterate politician. And another thing that concerns me there, really, uh, as an elected senator, uh, you're an elected senator in Australia, and yet social media platforms decide that you can be censored when the people of Australia uh, have elected you into your, your democratic position. It just seems a rather, a rather anomalous uh, situation that we find ourselves in, unfortunately. Well, being elected doesn't mean you are authorised to spread misinformation. And also, because of how the Australian electoral system works, being elected doesn't mean many people voted for you. In fact, Senator Rennick personally only got 1,176 votes, which is 0.04% of the vote in his state. Now, as I mentioned, John also did an interview with Professor Clancy from Australia about the document. A lot of it was just rehashing the same nonsense as he covered in other videos, but he did bring up a few other things. If you'd like to know why they were also nonsense, I will provide a link to this Twitter thread here by Professor Mark Veldhoen, who is a professor of immunology in the video's description. And just in case you were concerned that people in Australia take Professor Clancy seriously, here's a clip of him explaining that they don't. I approached the College of Pathologists on two occasions. The first occasion, I didn't even get a response. Uh, and again, you know, I, I'm not a, a junior person in this system. Uh, the second occasion, uh, I, I, I actually rang up to make sure that it went to the uh, President. Ultimately, I got a, a response back via the Secretary saying, well, look, we think uh, it's, it's not something we can do. Um, let, let, why don't you ask the TGA to do this? But let's go back to John for some closing remarks. So what someone needs to do now, really, I haven't had time to do this today, but um, look back to people in authority who said this wasn't systemically distributed. And given that this report um, is from the TGA on January 2021, anyone who said that after January 2021 
Uh, well, the best thing we can say is they were poorly informed, isn't it? Yes. Let's see if we can find any examples of these poorly informed people. But it's really quite simple that, that it, it, it shouldn't enter the bloodstream. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee or beautiful Cindy here a treat. We really appreciate your support. We will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to see them, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.